Hello students, hope you all are fine. So once again, welcome to my channel. You are watching Dr. Sandeepan Sen Gupta's Modern Biology, meant for CSIR, NET and GET Life Sciences. And you are listening to your favorite Dr. Sandeepan Sen Gupta, who is an assistant professor of microbiology and biotechnology. So today I'm back with a new lecture session of biochemistry and we'll continue our discussion about enzymes because in our previous biochemistry lecture, we have discussed and taken an introductory look over enzymes corresponding to the syllabi of CSIR net and get biochemistry life sciences. So today we'll continue our discussion and discuss more about enzymes. So in our previous session, we just have taken an introductory look of enzymes while going through the definition, the properties of enzymes in very brief and, about, and while going through, we have also went through a large number of terminologies that are important in the branch of enzymology, like cofactors, coenzymes, apoenzymes, conjugated enzyme or hollow enzyme, prosthetic group, active site, and so on. So today we'll carry forward our discussion about enzymes and we'll, that is particularly discuss about the non-protein part of enzymes. So we'll particularly discuss about the two classes of enzyme non-protein parts of enzymes or enzyme non-protein components, that is cofactors and coenzymes. And this is going to be a very detailed discussion about the different, that is the two classes of non-protein parts, cofactors and coenzymes, different, uh, that is types of cofactors, different types of coenzymes, or the functions that are being performed by cofactors and coenzymes. And with a very, this discussion will be, thus proceed forward with a very special reference to the sections from which the a large number of questions are frequently asked in CSIR net and get life science biochemistry examinations. Also in other examinations like ICMR, DBT, etc. So stay tuned, watch the, the video from beginning till end without skipping any segment. This is truly going to be very informative and is going to be very thrilling and exciting lecture session about the non-protein part of enzymes, that is cofactors and coenzymes, their different types, and uh, that is examples of enzymes, along with the functions performed by them. So let's start. So as I already uh, that is said in the beginning that in regarding in enzymes that is uh, about enzymology that is we have discussed about we came across various terminologies we came across the definition of enzymes about the properties of enzymes and so on so uh, we'll recap a little bit I'll recap uh, that is begin with a short recap for you all so what do we mean by enzymes enzymes are actually biocatalysts which can catalyze a large number of reactions occurring inside living cells and tissues. So in chemistry lab, we have heard about catalysts. So what are these catalysts? Catalysts in different sub-branches of work, in different sub-branches of chemistry under laboratory conditions to speed up chemical reactions. So similar to catalysts, our analogous to catalysts are the enzyme biocatalysts, which speed up biochemical reactions occurring inside cells and tissues of living systems and organs. So all biochemical reactions are speeded up or are sped up by Cattle biocatalysts called enzymes, and in the absence of enzymes, the uncatalyzed reactions are very, very slow in nature. And enzymes are associated with a wide range of biochemical reactions, be it digestion, be it conduction of nerve impulse, be it contraction of muscles, all these involve the activity of enzymes. 
So, so what is the biochemical nature of enzymes? Enzymes and that is are protein biomolecules. That is, enzymes are proteinaceous in nature and have a complex three-dimensional structure. So, same as that of a protein, an enzyme is having a complex three-dimensional structure. And like enzymes speeds up or catalyzes a biochemical reaction by accelerating the conversion of substrate into product. How that we we'll look forward in our coming slides, that is in our coming discussion. And hence, can like catalysts are un remain unused at the end of chemical reactions. Similarly, enzymes being biocatalysts do not alter the equilibria of biochemical reactions and remain unused and are left up unconsumed at the end of a biochemical reaction so that they can again associate with the substrate and start up a new range or start up another cycle of the same biochemical reaction. Now, the act Activity of an enzyme, the structure of uh, it highly depends upon the integrity of uh, the structure of an enzyme. That is, structural integrity of a protein enzyme plays a very important role in its activity. So let's take a small look over the structure of a protein enzyme. So similar to a protein, there are four different levels of structure of a protein enzyme, primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure, and quaternary structure. By primary structure, we simply mean to refer to the linear sequence of constituent amino acids that the enzyme is made up of. And how are the amino acids linked together? They are linked together by C-O-N-H peptide bonds or amide bonds. Now, when we uh, talk about the secondary structure of any enzyme, that is by secondary structure, we mean to refer to low local conformation of a part of the enzyme or polypeptide chain. That is by secondary structure, we mean to refer to three-dimensional arrangement of certain atoms that are confined to a region or a certain part or a section of the enzyme polypeptide or protein enzyme. And there are different forms of secondary and protein, there are secondary structures of protein enzymes like alpha helix, beta pleated sheets, then turns, loops, folds, etc. Now, next to secondary structure comes a higher order structure, that is a tertiary structure. In tertiary structure of an enzyme, the elements of secondary structure are grouped together to form super secondary motifs or super secondary folds, like alpha helix and beta pleat linked together, that is to form alpha beta motif, then in when in which alpha helix and beta pleated sheet are present in an alternative fashion, then beta pleated sheets and beta pleated sheets are linked together to form beta meander motif and so on. And likewise, there are four different classes of supersecondary motifs. And after the supersecondary motifs are linked together, the structure is further compacted, folded, and looped to form the tertiary structure, which represents the three dimensional dimensional structure of a single polypeptide chain of a protein enzyme. So tertiary structure is a single polypeptide chain of a protein enzyme. So M for our, that is a oligomeric or a multimeric enzyme having different polypeptide chains, it's every polypeptide chain will have its own tertiary structure. And then well, what is the highest order of the enzyme structure? The quaternary of the, that is three degree structure is the highest order of enzyme structure in which the tertiary structures of different polypeptide chains are mixed up together and further compacted, folded, and moved to form a very compact three-dimensional structure that represents the overall three-dimensional structure of the entire enzyme and represents the structure of three-dimensional structure of all polypeptides of an oligo protein enzyme mixed up or jumbled together. So tertiary structure is the 
highest level of structure of a protein enzyme. And integrity of this structure is very important for the activity of enzyme. And then the structure gets denatured and uh, that is as a result of alteration of cellular environment or gets denatured under a wide range of conditions. That is when the enzyme gets denatured or is broken down into its constituent amino acids and enzyme loses its activity. So denaturation makes an enzyme non-functional non and an enzyme gets denatured due to variations in cellular environment like pH, temperature, that is when it is subjected to a very high temperature, there'll be a disruption of hydrogen bonds and that will disrupt the overall structure of enzyme. Then an enzyme also gets denatured and loses its structure when it is dissolved in or is subjected to organic solvents like ethanol, then that is alcohol, etc. When it is treated with detergents, when it is treated with certain solutes, etc. So as all these, under all these conditions, as soon as an enzyme loses its structure, its activity or its function is also lost. So intact of an enzyme structure is an absolute necessity for the intact function of an enzyme. Now, let us have or take a quick look over some very essential properties of enzymes one by one. Reaction specificity. That is, uh, enzymes are very specific to substrates and will catalyze or act over only particular molecule. A molecule that, that is binds to an enzyme and is acted upon by an enzyme is called as a substrate. And depending upon the substrate over which an enzyme acts, the enzyme is given its common name, like maltase will only act over its substrate maltose. Sucrase will only act over its substrate sucrose. Lactase will only act over its substrate lactose. Then urease will only act over its substrate urea. Now, why is it so? This is because an enzymatic reaction is confined to a small part of the enzyme, the so-called the pocket of an enzyme that is called as an active site. So that is now when an, an enzymatic reaction occurs, there are a large number of unfavorable environments that are generated inside living cells. Like there are formation of unstable charged intermediates. There are collisions between substrate molecules to speed up or to start and that is for, for uh, that is the beginning of a biochemical reaction or for the catalysis of reaction so that is an um, unfavorable in an environment might be generated inside a cell and to avoid these unfavorable circumstances an enzyme circumvents these circumstances by keeping its biochemical reaction restricted to a small portion, so-called the pocket or the act site of an enzyme. So an enzymatic reaction is confined in particular and only exclusively to its pocket or the active site of an enzyme. And this active site is lined with, perfectly lined with amino acid residues that are complementary to the structure of substrate. So a substrate with only with proper amino acid residues complementary to the amino acids that is or to the that is structure of the active site of enzyme will only fit into the active site or a substrate with a proper geometry only fits into the active site of enzyme like a lock or that is has only a specific key we'll come in more detail about these in uh, another lecture session when we we'll discuss about enzyme substrate specificity further this that is going through that is Korshland's induced fit model and lock and key hypothesis.
Now, next to reaction specificity, another important property of enzyme is that its activity is affected by cellular environment. The conditions inside a cell, like pH, temperature, affect the activity of an enzyme. Every enzyme has its own specific pH and works best at a particular pH, which is called the optimal pH of an enzyme. So, and some enzymes work best at acidic pH, like pepsin has a pH 2 is its optimal pH. Other enzymes work best at neutral pH, like amylase works best at pH 7, while there are certain enzymes which choose alkaline pH and prefer active, uh, that is, show their optimal activity at alkaline pH, like li, uh, trypsin. Trypsin, that is, uh, chooses an alkaline pH and shows optimal activity at alkaline pH 8, etc. Now, next to pH is temperature. That is, temperature inside a cell is a very important factor affecting and governing the activity of an enzyme. And each enzyme works its best and performs its best at a particular temperature, so-called optimal temperature, when at which an enzyme that is delivers, acts, or performs optimally. So usually, most of the enzymes inside living cells work best in and around in between 37 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius. That is the normal cellular temperature. However, there are certain exceptions, and there are heat-stable enzymes which are present in thermophiles, which are present in hyperthermophiles, which are present in organisms living in very hot environments, which are, that is, not affected by changes in temperature and can withstand a large range of temperature. Enzymes that are used in PCR, that is polymerase chain reaction to amplify a gene, are heat-stable DNA polymerases, like TAC DNA polymerase, PFU DNA polymerase, Vent DNA polymerase, which can withstand a large range of temperature. However, for most of these enzymes, if the temperature is raised beyond the optimal temperature, then the enzyme starts, that is, losing its structure. Bonds are affected, like hydrogen bonds. Hydrophobic interactions get affected, and an enzyme gets denatured and finally loses its activity. Substrate concentration is another very important factor affecting the activity of an enzyme. Initially, along with an increase in substrate concentration, there's an increase in initial velocity of an enzyme enzyme, so-called V0. V0 stands for the initial velocity of an enzyme catalyzed reaction, and therein lies a linear relationship. Initially, the reaction follows first order kinetics, and there is a linear relationship between substrate concentration, between substrate concentration and the velocity of an enzyme catalyzed reaction. But the velocity or the initial velocity, that is the velocity, keeps on increasing till the maximum velocity that is V max is attained. So the then the maximum after the maximum velocity of an enzyme catalyzed reaction V max is attained. There is no further increase in uh, that is uh, activity. There is no further increase in activity of enzyme along with an increase in substrate concentration. And that is the substrate concentration at which half V max or half of the maximum Maximal velocity is attained has been is defined by a constant called Km. And these, that is, terminologies have that is like initial velocity V0, maximum velocity V max, then substrate concentration S, then Km, that is our constant, Michaelis constant, are well correlated. And in order to and are used to study that is the behavior of enzyme and the kinetics of an enzyme catalyzed reaction, which are well, which are all jumbled up, that is all linked up together to form, that is an equation
equation known as the Michaelis Menten equation. That is, we'll, when we'll study in very detail about Michaelis Menten enzyme kinetics while going through enzyme kinetics and inhibition. And enzyme concentration is also not that much important, but also an important factor governing the activity of an enzyme. And an enzyme that is the when present at its optimal concentration works its best. If there is a very small amount of enzyme present that is not sufficient to drive the catalysis of the back chemical reaction, then the progress of reaction is very slow. So another important property of enzyme is that similar to a catalyst, it remains unused at the end of a bad chemical reaction. It is not exhausted or renovated, but is left up, that is not consumed, and is, it stays unused so that it associates, it leaves the product and associates itself with another substrate molecule to start a new raid round of a biochemical reaction or same biochemical cycle. Now, let's take a quick look over function of enzymes. We'll take a thorough look in a separate session, that is, but uh, uh, what is the role of enzymes and how do they do, uh, that is, perform their, that is, catalytic activity. The role of enzyme is to accelerate or speed up biochemical reactions. So uncatalyzed in reactions and the absence of enzymes occurring in living systems are very, very slow. So the enzyme, the reactions, that is, for the conversion of substrate to product, there must be an enzyme that must bind the substrate and must provide, that is, you now it must promote effective collision between substrate molecules so that it gets converted into product. So, and the role of an enzyme is to accelerate or speed up a biochemical reaction. And how it does so? It does so by lowering down the act activation energy barrier. So what do we mean by activation energy? It is the minimum amount of energy required to produce a collision that is powerful enough to start up a biochemical reaction. So the smallest amount of energy that is required to produce an effective collision between substrates and to catalyze and start up a biochemical reaction and convert the substrate into product is the activation energy and it's by lowering this activation energy barrier that enzymes catalyze biochemical reactions. So enzymes, what do they do? They lower down the activation energy barrier. In the absence of enzyme, this activation energy barrier required to start up and required to catalyze the or facilitate the conversion of substrate to product is very high as seen in the diagram. But in presence of enzyme, this activation energy there is lower down and an enzyme lowers down and uh, the activation energy barrier and in course facilitates the easy conversion of substrate into product by making the spells by making the cell spend a very less amount of energy to generate effective collision between the substrates but what is the source of this activation energy or from how does an enzyme what is the source of the lowering of this activation energy and how does an enzyme lower down the activation energy? There must be a source of energy for enzymes which helps an enzyme to lower down the activation energy barrier. Yes, therein lies a source, and that is binding energy. So when an enzyme reacts with a substrate, there are a large number of non-covalent interactions occurring. So like uh, hydrogen bonds forms, uh, that is engages with the substrate via non-covalent interactions, like hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic interactions, ionic and Van der Waals interactions, as a result of which a large amount of edge energy is generated, so-called binding energy, and this it is this binding energy which is the source of energy used by the enzyme to lower down the activation energy barrier and to catalyze the simple conversion, biochemical conversion of a substrate into a product. We look into very detail about the mode of action and mechanism of action of enzymes in a separate lecture session.
today we'll study in very detail and in much detail about the two classes of non-protein that is parts of enzyme so let us that is uh, uh, let us uh, switch over to that now, uh, in uh, that is uh, our introductory session, we have taken a look that almost that is we all know all we all know that all enzymes, with the exception of ribozymes and enzyme abzymes, are proteinaceous in nature and have a complex three-dimensional structure similar to that of protein. So, so enzymes are protein biomolecules, but is it only the protein part that an enzyme needs to perform its biocatalysis? No, it's not the protein part, but beyond and beside the protein part, there's a non-protein part that and the protein part of an enzyme requires to lower down the activation energy barrier. And there's a non-protein part of an enzyme combines with the protein part of an enzyme to form the catalytically active enzyme, which is called as conjugated enzyme or hollow enzyme. So until and unless the non-protein part binds till the non-protein part binds uh, to with uh, binds to and associates with the protein part of an enzyme. Uh, protein only the protein part of an enzyme is catalytically inactive in itself and this catalytically inactive protein part of enzyme is known as apoenzyme or apoprotein and when this apoenzyme is joined by a non-protein part together and the non-protein and protein parts form what is called as an active enzyme so-called conjugated enzyme or hollow enzyme. Now, we'll speak about the non-protein parts of enzymes. There may be non-protein parts of enzymes may be of two different types. That is, uh, there are certain uh, uh, either a metal, inorganic metal ion or inorganic metal cofactor serves as a non-protein part of enzyme or an organic or organometallic molecule called a coenzyme serves as a non-protein part of enzyme. So there are two classes of non-protein parts of enzymes. So that is why the, the first class consists of metal ions called inorganic metal ions called cofactors like manganese, magnesium, zinc, iron, and a wide range of metal ions. And the second class consists of organic or organometallic molecules called coenzymes, which act as non-protein part of enzymes and facilitate the transfer transfer of specific functional groups to promote the biocatalysis reaction or to promote the enzymatic reaction. So what uh, are, that is, as a non-protein part, an enzyme may require or may have only a two-factor or a coenzyme, but they, it has been found that most of the enzymes require both metal ions called cofactors and organic molecules called coenzymes for their activity. And how are these, that is, how is this non-protein part, that is, uh, how, how is it uh, that is bound to the protein part of enzyme? The non-protein part is, that is, in e is most often loosely bound to the protein part of enzyme. But when this non-protein part, I be a cofactor or a coenzyme, is very tightly or even covalently linked to the protein part of enzyme, this non-protein, such a protein, non-protein part, is called as a prosthetic group. So what is a prosthetic group? A non-protein part of enzyme be a metal cofactor that is inorganic metal ion or an organic coenzyme that is very tightly or even covalently bound to the protein part of an enzyme is called as a prosthetic group. So under this special circumstance, the non-protein part of an enzyme becomes a prosthetic group when it is linked by covalent bonds like disulfide bonds or very strong bonds to the protein part of enzyme. Otherwise, the, the, that is cofactors and coenzymes are linked to the protein part of enzyme, that is apoenzyme, by weak non-covalent interactions like ionic interactions, hydrogen bondings that they participate in apoenzyme and 
cofactor and apoenzyme coenzyme interaction, etc. So now see, uh, uh, we'll all together have a look over. This is the that is overall structure of the conjugated a hollow enzyme with its protein part called apoenzyme and with its two non-protein parts. One being the inorganic metal ion that is cofactor, and other being the organic molecule that will facil that facilitates or that serves as the carrier of specific functional group, so called. The, Coenzyme. Now we were that is uh, pertaining to the that is uh, possession that is uh, with respect to the conjugated or hollow enzyme or pertaining to conjugated or hollow enzyme. The coenzyme is very close to the act site of enzyme. So coenzyme is very close to the pocket of enzyme to which an enzymatic reaction is confined and is very close to the active site of enzyme. And hence, the coenzyme picks up certain functional groups and is able to transfer functional group from one substrate to another substrate. Hence, what do these coenzymes mean? This is, that is coenzymes are the transient carriers of specific functional groups like amine group, carboxyl group, that is COO minus amine group, NH2, then aldehyde group, that is aldehyde carbon and C double bond O single bond H, etc. And these coenzymes are obtained from different forms of vitamins that are required and are present in minute quantities and trace amounts in our diet. But cofactor, what is the location of the cofactor that is in a conjugated the hollow enzyme, it's not that much close to the active site, but is at a distant location of possession, and thereby cofactor does not catalyze the transfer of specific functional groups, but cofactor is known to perform other functions like magnesium cofactors, now help then K plus, that is potassium cofactors, help to stabilize unstable enzyme that is transition states, unstable charged intermediates generated during enzyme catalyzed reactions. So, Prosthetic group, as we have already seen, that when is a cofactor or a coenzyme called a prosthetic group? When a cofactor or a coenzyme is not loosely, but very tightly or even covalently linked to the protein part of enzyme, that is apo, to apo enzyme, to form conjugated or hollow enzyme. Under such circumstances, the non protein part, the be it cofactor or coenzyme, that is, becomes a prosthetic group. And what about the specific functions of coenzymes and cofactors, we come across the specific functions of coenzymes and cofactors in very details in our uh, that is in uh, that is in upcoming seconds in next few minutes. Now, cofactors, that is, as, as I briefed you earlier, said you earlier, that there are two kinds of non-protein enzyme parts. Uh, there are two types of non-protein components of enzyme, cofactors and coenzymes. Cofactors are inorganic metal ions which serve as non-protein parts of enzymes. And many of these enzymes require not single cofactor, but a large number of inorganic metal ions or inorganic metal cofactors for their activity. And such enzymes requiring cofactor, inorganic metal ion cofactors for their activity are known as metallozymes. Now, inorganic metal ions, what do they do? They usually are away from the active site of enzyme and they are found to perform a large number of important functions like stabilization of transition state, stabilization of unstable charged intermediate. So all these are unstable charge intermediates, transition states or transition state analogs are produced or are intermediates that are formed in between and the conversion of substrate to product or in between the biocatalysis, the catalytic activity of an enzyme.
Now, there are a large range of inorganic ions serving as cofactors for a wide variety of enzymes. Now, let's have a look over these cofactors one by one along with particular examples like copper. Copper in its Cu2 plus form, that is, acts as a cofactor for cytochrome and for a group of enzymes called cytochrome oxidases. So, cytochromes are the carriers of, uh, that are involved in electron transport chain and electron transport chain or ETC, uh, that is the respiratory chain in mitochondria has four, that is complexes. Complex four is the cytochrome oxidase complex present in ETS or electron transport system of mitochondria. And the complex four called the cytochrome oxidase complex has two forms of copper as cofactors, Cu met or or metallic centers, CUA and CUB. Next to copper comes iron. Iron is in its Fe2 plus or Fe3 plus iron state, acts as a cofactor for a wide range of enzymes like cytochrome oxidases, catalase, peroxidase, etc. Iron is a major factor for the enzyme catalase or peroxidase. So, peroxidase will break down the unwanted product of aerobic respiration, that is hydrogen peroxide, into water. H2O2 that is generated as a result of aerobic respiration is an unwanted product and is toxic and is broken down by enzyme called catalase or peroxidase that requires iron cofactor for its activity and it breaks down with the help of iron cofactor the enzyme breaks down that is H2O2 hydrogen peroxide into toxic hydrogen peroxide or free radical into that is water H2. Magnesium in its Mg2 plus form serves as a cofactor for a large range of enzymes like glucokinase, hexokinase, glucose 6-phosphatase, etc. Glucokinase is the enzyme involved in the priming or the starting reaction of glycolysis or EMP pathway, in which or as a result of which glucose is converted to glucose 6-phosphate. Glucose is phosphorylated to glucose 6-phosphate, and which is the donor of the phosphate group, ATP donates the phosphate group that is carried by the enzyme kinase with its with the help of its mg2 plus cofactor that is to the um, uh, substrate to the six carbon of glucose to generate the product converted product that is glucose 6 phosphate now mg2 plus is a cofactor of another very important enzyme that is glucose 6 phosphatase that catalyzes the breakdown of glucose 6 phosphate into glucose. Now, pyruvate, uh, sorry, potassium. Potassium in its K plus ion form is a very important cofactor for a wide range of enzymes like pyruvate kinase, arginase, etc. Pyruvate kinase catalyzes the last reaction of glycolysis, that is, during which the phosphoenol pyruvate loses its phosphate group that is picked up by ADP to form ATP and is the that is dephosphorylated to form pyruvate. And this reaction catalyzed by pyruvate kinase, that is the conversion of phosphonol pyruvate to pyruvate catalyzed by pyruvate kinase, uses K plus as its inorganic metal cofactor. Now, nickel, nickel in its Ni2 term acts, uh, Ni2 plus form acts as a cofactor for the enzyme, for a large range of enzymes. One of them is urease. Urease will catalyze the hydrolysis of urea into to ammonia. That is, with the help of nickel to factor, urease enzyme breaks down urea to generate two molecules of ammonia. Now, another is another important cofactor is selenium. Selenium is an, is an important cofactor of an enzyme called glutathione peroxidase. It is again involved in catabolism or breakdown of hydrogen peroxide generated as uh, that is a result of toxic effect of aerobia, a free radical or is a toxic that is generated as a result of um, that is, is a toxic effect of aerobic respiration. In course of aerobic respiration, Respiration H2O2 the, that is generated, hydrogen peroxide generated, is toxic and is broken down into water by an enzyme called glutathione peroxidase that uses selenium as its cofactor.
glutathione peroxidase also uses, and there's an another enzyme that we have seen before called catalase or peroxidase that also breaks down, that is uh, hydrogen peroxide into water and uses iron, that is as its cofactor. Now, next comes manganese. Manganese is its Mn2 plus form that is, is used as a cofactor by a large range of enzymes. One of them is ribonucleotide reductase. So the enzyme ribonucleotide reductase with the help of its, with the help of its manganese cofactor reduces the ribonucleic acid the, that is the, uh, uh, to form deoxy. That is now ribonucleic acid to deoxyribonucleic acid or reduces NTP to DNTP while it reduces the, uh, that is the two prime, uh, that is reduces the two prime end of the pentose sugar, that is uh, ribose of NTP to produce the deoxyribose, that is the pentose sugar of DNTP. So ribonucleotide reductase is the enzyme that reduces NTP to DNTP using MN++ manganese to factor molybdenum. Molybdenum is also an important cofactor for not, not that many, but a few enzymes like dinitrogenase, nitrate reductase, etc. Zinc. Zinc is acts as metal inorganic cofactor for a large range of enzymes like carboxypeptidases, then carbonic anhydrase, alcohol dehydrogenase, etc. Alcohol dehydrogenase is a very important in, 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 enzyme involved in alcohol fermentation as as hope you all know that uh, at the end of five, that is EMP pathway or glycolysis, glucose is converted to pyruvate. Now, when this pyruvate, that is uh, uh, by the activity of enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase, is that is reduced to alcohol while NADH is oxidized to NAD plus. That is coenzyme NADH is also involved, and it also this enzyme alcohol dehydrogenase that can that is facilitates the conversion of pyruvate to alcohol involves the activity of metal cofactor that is zinc. Now, here's a list of these, that is cofactors and the enzymes that use these metal cofactors. Zn2 plus is present as a cofactor in carbonic anhydrase, carboxypeptidases, ANV, alcohol dehydrogenase. Then Cu2 plus is present as a cofactor in cytochrome oxidase. Manganese in its plus two state is present as a cofactor in ribonucleotide reductase. Magnesium in its plus two state is, is present as a cofactor in enzymes like hexokinase then glucose 6-phosphatase, pyruvate kinase, nickel in its plus 2 state is present as a cofactor in enzyme urease, molybdenum is for, uh, acts as a cofactor of nitrate reductase, dinitrogenase, selenium acts as a cofactor of, of, that is glutathione peroxidase, then manganese is a cofactor of ribonucleotide reductase, K plus or that is uh, potassium is a cofactor of pyruvate kinase, propanyl coa carboxylase etc let's take a look over some of these reactions which are catalyzed by the cofactors of these enzymes let's take a look over some specific examples now this is the priming reaction or the maiden reaction of glycolysis that is the, that involves the phosphorylation of glucose to glucose 6 phosphate and is catalyzed by glucokinase or hexokinase that uses mg2 plus as its cofactor. Now, this is the, la the next one is the last reaction of glycolysis that is that involves the conversion of phosphoenol pyruvate to pyruvate and is catalyzed by the enzyme called pyruvate kinase that uses potassium ion K plus as its cofactor. Now, then we have, we can see the, uh, that is another, uh, that is the role of selenium cofactor. Selenium acts as a cofactor, cofactor for the enzyme glutathione peroxidase, while glutathione peroxidase catalyzes, promotes the catalysis or breakdown of hydrogen peroxide, that is toxic radical into water, H2O, which is non-toxic.
Another example is ribonucleotide reductase. Now, ribonucleotide reductase using its manganese MN2 plus cofactor or MN plus plus cofactor reduces NTP of ribose to DNTP of that is deoxyribose. That is the two prime end of the that is ribose sugar is oxygenated. However, that is that is reduction or that is uh, uh, that is uh, or deoxygenation that is loss of oxygen atom at the two prime end of the sugar results in that is deoxyribose and results in DNTP that is deoxyribose sugar of the DNTP moiety. And this re reaction is facilitated by rabinucleotide reductase that uses MN plus plus manganese ion, MN2 plus ion as its cofactor. And what is the role of these U sheet cofactors? These do not facilitate the transfer of functional groups. However, these factors help to stabilize transition states, intermediate transition molecule, transition analogs, then energy that is uh, intermediates, unstable charged intermediates that are generated during the in course of the conversion of in between the conversion of substrate to product. Now, another example is urease. Urease uses nickel enzyme as its cofactor, and with the help of the metal cofactor nickel, urease facilitates the catalysis or breakdown of urea to generate two molecules of ammonia. That is CO, NH2, NH2 urea is broken down to produce two molecules of NH3 or NH4 plus ammonium ions. So this was all about a large number of metal inorganic cofactor ions with specific examples of enzymes in which they perform important functions. Now, next to cofactor, we have another non-protein part class of non-protein part of enzymes called coenzymes. So what are these coenzymes? As I already told you, coenzymes are, uh, that is organic or organometallic molecules that act as trans transient carriers of specific functional groups. So coenzymes, unlike cofactors, uh, coenz cofactors are inorganic in nature, but coenzymes are organic or organometallic complex molecules, which have complex structures, and they'll facilitate the transfer and simply carry, will pick up the functional group from one substrate and transfer it to another substrate to generate a product. And these coenzymes are the carriers of a large number of functional groups, like amine group, an H2 group is carried by a coenzyme called pyridoxal phosphate. Now, aldehyde group is carried by a coenzyme called tetrahydrofolate, that is THF. Then electrons are carried by a coenzyme called FAD, flavonadenine dinucleotide. Hydride ions, are, that is two hydrogen atoms, are carried by a coenzyme called NAD, that is nicotinide nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. So these coenzymes are the transient carriers of specific functional groups, and they are obtained from different forms of B vitamins and which are present in minute quantities and small quantities and trace amounts in our diet. So vitamins, vitamin-derived coenzymes actually facilitate the transfer of specific functional groups in between the substrates to catalyze a biochemical reaction acting as the non-protein part of enzyme. Now, if we try to draw a sharp line of contrast between cofactors and coenzymes, cofactors are inorganic metal ions, which are inorganic in nature, like manganese, magnesium, then uh, mm, uh, molybdenum, zinc, copper, iron, etc. Whereas coenzymes are organic or organometallic complex molecules, like nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, flavonadenine dinucleotide, then TPP, thymine pyrophosphate, PLP, pyridoxal phosphate, etc. And cofactors do not uh, that is carry the are uh, do not act as transient carriers of specific functional groups, but in turn, but they help to stabilize the unstable charged intermediates, reaction intermediates, and help to stabilize the unstable that is reaction intermediates and uh, un, that is uh, an unstable transition state analogs that are formed in between uh, enzymatic reaction or in course of an enzyme catalyst 
catalyzed reaction in between the conversion of substrate into product. So this is performed by cofactors. But on contrary, that is, what do coenzymes do? They carry, they act as carriers of functional groups and carry amine groups, carboxyl groups, one carbon compound like uh, methyl group, CH3, and uh, aldehyde carbonyl group in from one substrate to another to generate a rearrangement and to catalyze the bacterial reaction. Now, let us take a look over a wide range of coenzymes, and we'll come across examples of certain enzymes which use both cofactors and coenzymes as their non protein parts. Now, coenzymes are common uh, as uh, that is, serve as non protein part of uh, that is a large number of enzymes, which and every coenzyme that is specifically carries a particular functional group that is. Every FAD, flavin adenine dimethotide, that is carries electrons, flavin is a carrier of electrons, uh, that is across an enzymatic reaction and is obtained from vitamin B2, that is riboflavin, that is present in a uh, minute quantity in our diet. NAD, nicotinamide adenine dimethotide, is a carrier of hydridine. It carries carries two hydrogen atoms and is obtained from a B vitamin called niacin that is also present in very minute quantity in our diet. Now, what do you mean by hydride ion? Hydride ion is usually represented as H minus, that is when a hydrogen atom bears an additional electron that is altogether bears two electrons and one proton, it becomes hydride ion. And it is this hydride ion that whose trans Transport is facilitated by NAD. So altogether, NAD facilitates the transfer of two hydrogen atoms at once. Now, biocytin. Biocytin acts as a carrier of acid carboxyl group, COO minus, across a wide range of enzymatic reactions and is obtained from vitamin H or biotin. Now, it was formerly biotin, but now vitamin H is a form of B vitamin called vitamin B7. DVP. Thymine, it stands for thymine pyrophosphate. It's obtained from vitamin B1, that is thymine or the active form of thymine, that is benfotiamine, and TPP thymine pyrophosphate coenzyme acts as a carrier of aldehyde carbonyl group, that is C double bond or single bond H. Aldehyde carbonyl group is carried by TPP coenzyme across a wide range of back chemical reactions. PLP, pyridoxyl phosphate. Pyridoxyl phosphate is obtained from vitamin B6, that is pyridoxine, and acts as a carrier of and facilitates the transfer of amine group, that is NH2 group, from one substrate to another to catalyze a transamination reaction. Coenzyme A. Coenzyme A, that is CoA, acts as a carrier of SI group across a wide range of biochemical reactions, that is, and coenzyme A is obtained from anthotenic acid, a form of D vitamin that is present in very small quantity in our diet. THF, tetrahydrofolate. THF, tetrahydrofolate is obtained from vitamin B9 or folic acid, which is a water soluble form of B vitamin. And THF acts as a carrier of one carbon groups like CH3, methyl group. That is, one carbon groups of compounds are carried by THF coenzyme. Lipoate, lipoate, there's no vitamin source of lipoate as such. And lipoate acts as a carrier of electrons and acyl groups. Yes. Now, let us consider few examples of different enzymes in which, in which these coenzymes facilitate the transfer of specific functional groups. Now, there are a large number of enzymes of glycolysis. We'll consider example from TCA cycle, PrEP cycle, also called tricyclic acid or tricarboxylic acid cycle. 
here is a list of different coenzymes the uh, that is functional groups which they carry and the amino acids from which they are obtained tpp thymine pyrophosphate derived from vitamin b1 is a carrier of aldehyde carbonyl group then flav fad flavin adenine dinucleotide is a carrier of electrons hydrogen atoms and electrons and is obtained from b vitamin riboflavin vitamin b2 now nad is a carrier of two hydrogen atoms of hydride ions and is obtained from b vitamin that is niacin pyridoxine phosphate is a carrier of amine group and is obtained from a b form of vitamin that is pyridoxine biotin is a carrier of carbon acid carboxyl group coo minus or transfers acid carboxyl group in between substrates and thus facilitate carboxylation reactions and biotin is a, and the source of biocytin is actually vitamin b7 formally called vitamin h or biotin and coenzyme a is uh, there is no uh, that is coenzyme a acts as a carrier of si group and is obtained from that is pantothenate a form of b vitamin and tetrahydrofolate tetrahydrofolate acts as a carrier of one carbon compound like methyl groups and thf that is tetrahydrofolate uh, that is a cofactor now uh, is obtained from vitamin b9 that is folic acid the large number of reactions of glycolysis that is emp pathway and tc cycle involve are are be are, are catalyzed by enzymes which use these coenzymes so now let us take a quick look over some of these specific reactions now biocytin if we talk of biocytin 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 is obtained from biotin that is vitamin b7 the now formally called biotin and biocytin acts as a carrier of uh, that is facilitates the transfer of carboxyl group acid carboxyl group coo minus in between the substrates that is it will catalyze carboxylation reactions now let us take the example of pyruvate carboxylase pyruvate carboxylase that is gets carboxylated by bios biocytin by to form that is a four carbon compound called oxaloacetate so pyruvate a three carbon compound is carboxylated that is that is an acid carboxyl group is picked up and is that is from bicarbonate and is transferred to pyruvate by the biotin coenzyme of pyruvate carboxylase to form a four carbon compound Call oxaloacetate. Now we have now pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme complex. Hope you remember that at the end of glycolysis, glucose is converted to pyruvate. Now in a anaerobic pathway, that pyruvate undergoes oxidative decarboxylation and dehydrogenation and gets converted into acetyl CoA. The three-carbon pyruvate uh, loses carboxyl group CO minus and gets converted. into acetyl coa that is which then enters into tca cycle or krebs cycle now there is the oxidative decarboxylation and dehydrogenation reaction that is or the oxidative that is decarboxylation of pyruvate to acetyl coa is catalyzed by a multi enzyme complex called pyruvate dehydrogenase complex which involves the activity or the that is which involve the group transfer or uh, that is reactions facilitated by a wide range of coenzymes like tpp thymine pyrophosphate facilitating the transfer of aldehyde group now nad carrying two hydrogen atoms or hydride ions fad carrying electrons then we have lipoate the coenzyme the lipoate coenzyme its activity is also associated with pyruvate dehydrogenase hydrogenase enzyme complex then we have coenzyme a the carrier of acyl group whose activity is intimately associated with pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme complex so it's it has it's a complex of three enzymes e1 e2 e3 e1 is pyruvate dehydrogenase e2 is dihydrolipoyl trans acetylase and e3 is dihydrolipoyl dehydrogenase and e1 pyruvate dehydrogenase uses 
coenzyme A as its cofactor, uh, views as coenzyme A as its coenzyme, pyruvate dehydrogenase E1 enzyme of pyruvate dehydrogenase complex that carries a side group and generates acetyl -co coenzyme A. Now let us have a look over the reactions of Krebs cycle or tricyclic acid cycle after pyruvate gets converted to is oxidated, de decarboxylated and dehydrogenated to acetyl-CoA. This acetyl-CoA uh, enters into Krebs cycle in mitochondria. Krebs cycle is also called as tricarboxylic acid cycle or cyclic acid cycle. And a large number of reactions of the Krebs cycle are or TCA cycle also called tricarboxylic acid cycle are catalyzed by a wide range of enzymes which use the which uh, that is uh, which facilitate the transfer of involve the transfer of different functional groups across different substrates and thereby involve the activity of a wide variety of coenzymes like coenzyme A NAD, FAD, etc. The prime, the main, the first priming reaction that is of the TCA cycle in is a condensation reaction that is the in which the end product of TCA cycle that is oxaloacetate condenses and combines with the acetyl CoA generated after oxidative decarboxylation and dehydrogenation of pyruvate to produce a six carbon compound called citrate and this condensation is catalyzed by an enzyme called citrate synthase which deeply involves the activity of coenzyme a that carries or facilitates the transfer of acyl groups between the substrates two substrates that is oxaloacetate and acetyl coenzyme a so the first reaction of Krebs cycle is a condensation reaction in which oxaloacetate condenses with four carbon compound, condenses with acetyl-CoA uh, two carbon compound to produce the first product of citric acid cycle, which is citrate, a six carbon compound. And this reaction is catalyzed by citrate synthase that uses coenzyme A as its cofactor. That coenzyme A facilitates the transfer of or the facilitates is the transport of SI groups between the two substrates that is in between uh, oxaloacetate and acetyl CoA. Now, if we take a, now another important reaction of the citric acid cycle is the conversion of succinyl CoA to succinate. That is in the mid of mid phase of the cyclic acid cycle or TCA cycle, succinyl CoA gets converted to succinate, which de involves, and that is succinyl CoA gets converted to succinate by the activity of an enzyme called succinyl CoA synthetase or succinate thiokinase. And this CoA synthetase, succinate thiokinase or succinyl CoA synthetase also involves the activity activity of coenzyme A. So succinyl CoA is converted to succinate via succinyl coenzyme A, which involves the activity of coenzyme A that facilitates the transfer of acyl group across in between the substrates to generate the product that is succinate. Now, another important reaction is the conversion of succinate to fumarate that is catalyzed by succinate dehydrogenase. So that is now succinate, it's a dehydrogenation reaction or oxygen oxidation reduction reaction and as a result of this reaction succinate is converted to that is fumarate by succinate dehydrogenase that is an enzyme complex which uses FAD as its coenzyme and FAD is reduced to FADH2 while succinate is oxidized to fumarate by succinate dehydrogenase enzyme complex or succinate dehydrogenase enzyme. So citrate synthase, as I told you, involves the condensation of four carbon oxaloacetate plus two carbon acetyl CoA to produce the six carbon citrate that is the first product of citric acid cycle. And the it involves the activity of CoA SH that facilitates the transfer of acyl group in between the two substrates. Now we have succinyl CoA ligase or synthetase. Succinyl CoA synthetase actually also involves 
enhances the activity of coenzyme A and uh, that is facilitates the transfer of acyl group in between the substrate and the product. That is, uh, while it converts succinyl CoA to succinate, we have succinate to fumarate that is catalyzed by succinate dehydrogenase. It is the only enzyme involving F. AD that is succinate to fumarate or catalyzed by the enzyme succinate dehydrogenase is the only reaction that involves the activity of FAD coenzyme and FAD is reduced to FADH2 in course of in course of the conversion of succinate to fumarate. Lactate dehydrogenase uses nicotinamide adenine. There are a wide range of biochemical reactions in this, uh, that is, uh, in, uh, that is metabolism, in, uh, uh, that is fermentative reactions in aerobic and anaerobic respiratory metabolism, which use nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide as a carrier of two hydrogen atoms. That is, now lactate is, uh, in case of, uh, that is, uh, pyruvate is reduced to lactate, while is by an enzyme called lactate dehydrogenase, which uses NADH that is oxidized to NAD+. NADH is oxidized to NAD+, and pyruvate is reduced to lactate. This reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme called lactate dehydrogenase that uses nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide as its cofactor, and NADH gets oxidized to NAD+. Now, alcohol dehydrogenase. Alcohol dehydrogenase, that is ethanol, is... Uh, 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 reacts with NADH and NADH is again oxidized to NAD+. So, so alcohol dehydrogenase uses a nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide as its coenzyme. Another very important coenzyme, which we uh, need, do really need to talk about, is a carrier of amine group, NH2 group, and that is pyridoxal phosphate. Pyridoxal phosphate catalyzes transamination reactions in which there's a transfer of amine group or NH2 group in between the substrates or from one substrate to another substrate to generate the final product. Now, in the let us consider an example. Let us take the example of trans, that is alanine amino transferase so, or alanine transaminase. So, now, alanine is D amine, that is, it loses alanine amino acid alanine as a result of PLP, loses its amine group and is D aminated to form the keto acid analog that is pyruvate and what the what is the fate of this amine group the amine group lost by alanine is taken up by the coenzyme plp of the enzyme alanine transaminase or uh, uh, alanine amino transferase while plp in course gets converted that is pyridoxal phosphate in course gets converted into pyridoxamine phosphate after accepting plp now pyridoxamine phosphate donates its amine group to another substrate called alpha ketoglutarate that is an, uh, to another substrate that is alpha ketoglutarate to whose am amination yields a new product called glutamate so alanine plus alpha ketoglutarate the overall reaction becomes alanine plus alpha ketoglutarate gives rise to glutamate plus pyruvate so alanine is the donor of is gets that is leaves its or donates its amine group which is taken by pyridoxal phosphate to form pyridoxamine phosphate and plp pyridoxamine phosphate coenzyme uh, donates and from its amine group to alpha ketoglutarate and promotes the amination transamination of alpha ketoglutarate to generate the final product that is glutamate and what is the left out residue is keto acid analog so called so that is Pyruvate. So this reaction catalyzed by alanine tran amino transferase involves the activity of coenzyme that is PLP pyridoxal phosphate and there are a large number of amino transferases which involve the activity of PLP coenzymes to facilitate the transfer of amine group from one substrate to another substrate to generate a new product. So these were some 
there are specific examples of enzymes who involving the activity of a wide range of coenzymes like NAD, FAD, coenzyme A, then TPP, then pyridoxal phosphate, PLP, that is, and uh, uh, that is, and uh, these uh, reactions catalyzed uh, with a uh, uh, were catalyzed by enzymes with the help of these coenzymes. While the coenzymes trans facilitated the transfer of specific functional groups from one substrate to another to generate a new product. Now uh, let us see that uh, how coenzymes work. Before we conclude, let us see a, this is a general model meant for the activity of coenzymes. So coenzyme the activity of coenzyme is the activity seems to be a bit complex. It, the diagram has been the overall activity is represented in four different stages, but it's not that much complex as such. So how coenzyme works? So let us take the example of PLP coenzyme, that is pyridoxal phosphate. It facilitates the transfer of amine group. So PLP coenzyme acts over one substrate, which deaminates one substrate, except an amine group to form pyridoxamine phosphate and then pyridoxamine phosphate transfers the amine group uh, to its uh, substrate 2 or aminate substrate 2 to form the final product. So let us explain, um, let us understand this by considering the example of tran alanine transaminase or alanine amino transferase. So that is, in, that is the overall reaction catalyzed by alanine amino transferase is pyruvate plus alpha ketoglutarate gives rise to that, uh, sorry, alanine plus alpha ketoglutarate gives rise to pyruvate plus glutamate. So the substrate one in this reaction is alanine and this substrate one loses its amine group which and donates its amine group to PLP of co coenzyme of the enzyme. So the alanine is substrate one which loses its amine group and amine group is picked up by PLP pyridoxal phosphate which becomes pyridoxamine phosphate. Now pyridoxamine phosphate in the next step transfers its amine group to second substrate which to second substrate which is alpha ketoglutarate over here. So pyridoxamine phosphate facilitates the amination or transamination of the second substrate by transferring the amine group that is uh, from it to the second substrate to generate a new product. In this case, the second substrate is alpha ketoglutarate, which is aminated by pyridoxamine phosphate to produce the amine form of alpha ketoglutarate, that is glu aminated alpha ketoglutarate, that is glutamate. And the left out is the keto acid analog, that is pyruvic acid or pyruvic. So this is how the coenzymes work. That is PLP coenzyme involves the activity of two substrates and PLP coenzyme deaminates one substrate, then picks up, takes up the amine group, becomes pyridoxamine phosphate, and then transfers this amine group to second substrate or aminates the second substrate to produce the final product and the keto acid analog or of the or substrate one or, or the first substrate is left out. So this is the mode of action of coenzyme. This is in brief how coenzymes work. And we have considered, that is, um, the, uh, studied the case by, uh, uh, by taking the example of PLP cofactor, pyridoxamine phosphate cofactor. <laughs> So this was all about, uh, that is, uh, coenzymes and cofactors. Hope you have enjoyed the session. We studied in much detail about the two different classes of non-protein parts of enzymes, that is cofactors, the inorganic metal ions like manganese, magnesium, calcium, and coenzymes, the organic or organometallic molecules like NAD, FAD, coenzyme A, which facilitate the transfer of functional groups, that is from in between the two substrates to generate a new 
product. So this was all about cofactors and coenzymes. Hope you have learned a lot of new important things. There are a lot of questions with, which are asked from these that is, sections in CSI, Net and Get that is pertaining to the various enzymes using the coenzymes, various enzymes using that is cofactors, inorganic metal ion cofactors, etc. So if you have really enjoyed the session, do subscribe my channel. That is your one subscription would push me ahead to reach out to more and more students and would energize me to come up with more and more such lecture sessions corresponding to the syllabi of CSIR net and get. In upcoming lecture session, we will continue our discussion, enzymology discussion, and we will discuss about the mode of action of enzymes or mechanism of action of enzymes or how enzymes work. Till then, stay tuned and just keep watching my videos. Goodbye. Take care. Right. Yeah.